The upcoming season of Marvel Snap has been nearly fully data mined, so let's take a look at what this Asgardian season could hold with a season pass card that looks nearly as strong as Agent Venom and a variety of unique additional cards coming out in the spotlight caches and a couple of data mined cards that we're not actually sure how they're going to be released. Let's jump into it. First up is the Season Pass card Surter, a 3-5 that gains 3 power whenever you play a card with 10 or more power. This card is very difficult for me to overstate as a powerful card. I consider this sort of like the Agent Venom of 10's decks. One of the big things that 10's decks have been missing, and this hasn't stopped them from being good, but it has stopped them from being elite, 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 is a way to get Scar discounted to zero on the final turn by just curving out. And what that means is they've been missing a three-cost card that can get to 10 power. This is that three-cost card. It is also just a really big card, right? Like It's not like it stops scaling when it hits that second proc. It'll continue to scale upwards and upwards and upwards, even if you play, let's say, a Scar and something else on the final turn of the game. Part of the reason I'm a big fan of this card is right now, the typical points packages in Marvel Snap are devoted to Agent Venom type decks and stopping the interaction that other decks have with them. Famously, the last time Tens decks got really, really good was in a similar situation where there was a deck that was dominant that was sort of predicated on using Eliath, which in this case, the Agent Venom decks use Cosmo, but the main premise is the same, that they want to stop the interaction with them once they're very far ahead. That is something that Scar is very good at beating. Just a big free guy, the ability to put a massive amount of power on the board on the final turn of the game, and, and this is crucial, the ability to not care at all about whether or not your on-reveal effects are happening. The effects on the cards don't matter once they're played. And I think that's a really big deal. And I think this kind of deck, this kind of Surter Scar Tens deck, is the kind of thing that might be able to compete with Agent Venom. And so I'm interested to see. I honestly thought they would probably nerf Agent Venom by now, but now this is a new card coming out that is creating an archetype that I think matches up pretty well into a lot of that stuff. I'm not saying it matches up perfectly, like it's gonna have some issues, but it can compete on points, I would imagine, with the bounce decks, for example, because that 11 power scar for free is a really difficult thing to deal with. And even this deck can maybe run a Cosmo to go alongside its 11 power scar, run an Eliath maybe to go alongside its 11 power free scar. Like this is the kind of thing that I think can compete on numbers with some of the strongest Agent Venom decks in the game. And I'd be really interested to see how that matchup really works out. This kind of dynamic where it's like Surter decks running into Agent Venom decks, I think is something that I would expect to see a lot of going forward. This is a very, very powerful card. I do want to take just a moment and note that this card has been changed multiple times and talk about one of the designs that was data mined previously, which was basically the same thing, but at the two cost slot. A lot of the reaction that that card got was that it wasn't as strong as this version of the card. And I think maybe when you consider that this is a 3-5, that's probably true. But generally speaking, I would actually rather have this effect on a cheaper card and get more stats than have my guaranteed scar to the scar to zero proc. I tend to think of that as more important. But right now, what this deck needs is a 310, effectively. It needs a card that you can play 3, 4, 5. We have plenty of 410s. We have plenty of 510s. We don't have any 310s. And if you just go 3, 4, 5 free scar, that's a really powerful thing to do. That's what Surter is bringing to the table right now. In addition, it scales beyond that. If you are actually playing that Scar, it's not just going to be a 311. It's going to be a 314. If you're playing another 10 with it, it's going to be a 317. This card's ridiculous. I think this is one of the strongest cards in the game. I think it is an easy candidate for like comp competition with Agent Venom, which I think most people agree is the strongest slash most meta-defining card in the game right now. This is a big, big deal of a card. I am very, very clear on that to me. I find it hard to believe that a card that is A, exactly what this deck has been missing, that three cost slot, and B, scales relatively beyond even just being a 310, 
is going to be something that is actually bad. I think this card is going to be ridiculous. It's going to be very strong. It's going to be a an instant metagame performer. I just smashed my hand into the microphone right there. That's how much I'm like, you, you guys can't, can't see this, but usually like when I'm zoomed out far enough, I'm like making a bunch of hand motions. I'm hand talking a little bit. And that gets more intense the more intense I get. Whenever I'm smashing the mic, it's because I'm making, like, I'm really into it. And that should illustrate to you exactly how excited I am for this card to come out. In week one of the caches is Frigga. And she's a little bit difficult for me to get a read on. The fact that she doesn't hit the card after her makes her kind of a hard card to actually figure out how to make work, right? Like, am I meant to play this on a card that I play on turn four so I can get a copy of it and then bring it back for turn five? What are my good targets for that? What are the things that are going to allow me to do strong stuff with this card? When I think about good targets for this, I think about, like, powerful honor reveals that scale upwards, right? Like, I'm thinking about, like, okay... I would like to clone my three energy Iron Man that's actually a Mystique. I'd love to clone that, but that normally doesn't happen until turn six anyway. I would like to clone my Hit Monkey. And like, yeah, I would, but I'd also like to play that later and using my whole turn five to clone it instead of bounce it just doesn't really seem incredibly useful. I'd like to clone my Sage. What this card I think is really missing is a really strong two cost scaler. So that you can go, like, if Sage costs two, you could go Sage plus this on turn five, and that'd be, like, really good. That's the kind of stuff that I think it wants to be. Another card that it could go really well with is maybe Scream. I do think that the fact that Screams scale, like, multiplicatively, having two Screams is actually, like, genuinely kind of busted. It's a very strong thing to do. That's an interesting way to take this. But I'm not exactly sure how you do the rest of what you're trying to do when you play a strategy like that. Like, granted, yeah, having two screams is effectively adding eight power to every move you make. That's a really big deal. But also, the second scream is only coming down on turn four. So if you're going to, like, scream, frigga the scream, scream plus something, like, that does seem strong, but it does have to happen that way. And I'm not sure frigga has a lot of good targets otherwise with her weird, awkward stat line. What I'm confused about with this card is what it actually wants to go with. I'm not necessarily saying that this card is not doing anything strong. I think it probably is doing something strong. I just don't know if that thing is going to be enough for this card to be a reasonable inclusion in the deck at 3-3. I can tell you what deck probably does want this, though, and that is actually Cerebro 3. I, I realize that's like kind of a deep cut, deep pull, and if like the best thing this card is doing is Cerebro 3, it's probably not a card that most people are going to pick up. But I actually do think that is the kind of thing Cerebro 3 is very interested in. It likes having cards that create extra value for it. It likes being able, obviously, to copy Cerebros. And it is very able to play those out on earlier turns of the game and very happy to do so. I'm not saying, again, that it's like the greatest thing in the world to be doing, but I wouldn't be so shocked to see it make its way into there. What I'm trying to figure out with this card is, does it do anything else? And I think in the absence of like a really powerful two-drop scaler, because you want either a two-drop scaler like Scream that you can play curve into this, or a two-drop that scales like Sage and that you can play on turn five alongside this so you get a bigger one on turn six. Those are the things this card seems to want to do, and I can't figure out how to make those happen necessarily, or at least I can figure out how to make them happen. I can't figure out how to make them be worth playing instead of other stuff. Right now, my best hope for this card is the Scream stuff, then Cerebro 3, and I think that's kind of not a ringing endorsement of purchasing this card. It seems like maybe we'd be able to pull something off with Destroy, but the issue with trying to do this with Destroy is that Destroy really wants to use all of those turns actually blowing up the Deadpool, and so it's like, you know, you can probably get something out of this. Like, if you get your Deadpool up high enough early, getting a second Deadpool is definitely not bad. But if you get your Venom high enough early, getting a second Venom is definitely not bad. But you are taking a turn off of blowing stuff up in order to do that, and that's only going to be worth it some of the time. So I think Destroy is another potential home, but I'm not sure it's one that, like, it actually ag aggressively makes the cut. But there are certain, like, we all know how strong cloning Vats has been with Destroy X and can be with Destroy X and... It definitely does seem like this is the kind of card that, like, can do strong stuff. As I'm talking this out, the other card that really sort of 
comes to mind here as a potential good Frigga target is US Agent. It scales with itself, and it is a very large card, and it is that kind of card you can play alongside this on turn five. So I'm interested to see. Like, there's some cool stuff you can do with this. You can Gwenpool something, then Frigga the cheap thing that you Gwenpooled. There's stuff, right? I'm not sure there's enough stuff, and I'm not sure that stuff is going to be able to compete with Scar stuff or with Agent Venom stuff, but I am interested to see what this card can do. Malekith is a 4-6 with an on reveal ability that takes a 1, 2, or 3 cost card out of the deck, puts it on the board, and says it reveals at the end of the game. This is genuinely a pretty big stat stick, right? Like, this is a big guy. What's interesting to me is when I look at him, what comes to mind are cards like Anti-Venom and Iron Lad, and then the question becomes, is this more like that, or is he doing something unique and special that those cards can't really do? One thing this card is doing is deck thinning, and there is some real value in that. A world where you are able to play Malekith and Jubilee, for example, is getting two cards out of your deck before the final turn of the game. That could really end up mattering. Are there cool things you can do with this in Hella in order to take advantage of that? Probably not, because again, it reveals at the end of the game, and all your cheap cards are cards that want to come out on, on the board and discard cards before you end up helling, but hey, maybe I'm wrong. There are some interesting applications to a card like this in a world where, like, Sandman still exists, where you just play it as a pile of stats. In a world where Sandman doesn't exist, I've found it hard for four drops that are just stats to succeed. I'm not saying they can't succeed, but I have found it a little bit more difficult for just a big guy to be a major part of the game plan. I do also think that there is one potential additional application for this card, and that is in hazmat decks. Being able to just, like, not necessarily pick and choose and get your hazmat, but, like, have a pretty good chance at doing it, that's a really powerful thing to do if you don't have the hazmat in your hand. Like, effectively tutoring for a card like hazmat. Because when you have a card like this, you want to be able to have the strongest possible outcome for it. And among cheap cards... Cards like Hazmat and U.S. Agent, U.S. Agent obviously not great considering this is a Malekith, but you're probably playing Luke Cage anyway, are going to be your highest impact cheap guys just on their own. And I think that's probably where this card ends up going. The question is, ends up becoming like, is it worth running over other options in that slot? And that's a little bit harder for me to figure out. Another thing that people are going to look at this and say is like, oh, I can put this in my Surfer. This would be a Surfer card. Problem. It reveals at the end of the game. So if you pull anything that isn't Surfer, it's not getting a Surfer buff. So I don't really know if this can be a Surfer card. I definitely don't think it's better than Gwenpool. When I look at this card, I see fundamentally like a, not like a Grandmaster style card where like it's just like, you know, very underpowered relative to what it's doing. What I say, when I'm making the Grandmaster comparison here, I'm making the comparison in terms of this is finicky. It does do strong stuff but it's probably not doing the strong stuff at a reliable enough level to be a major part of metagames. That's where I'm at with this guy. On the other hand, like, there's definitely a world where this is just like, you know, a 412 most of the time you play him and you're just happy to run a 412. It's just, I don't think we've been in 412 is something I'm happy about land for a very long time. And a lot of that is as a consequence of like point ceiling cards like Agent Venom, the bounce decks, things like that. With the Surter card coming out and buffing the Scar decks, I, I, again, it just makes me hard. To, it makes it hard for me to feel like we're going to be happy with a conditional 412 when our opponents are playing, you know, 410s that discount their Scar to zero and buff their uh, Surter up by three points, right? Like it just makes it hard for me to believe that that's going to be the thing that fits in this metagame. Back when Sandman was stopping people from playing multiple cards on the final turn of the game, just a really big guy could probably do a lot of work, but I'm not sure that this is the moment for a card like Malekith to succeed. I have not seen such varied community perception on a card that I have seen on Fenris Wolf in a very long time. Fenris Wolf is a 2-3 with an activate that gets the highest power destroyed or discarded card from your opponent's group of destroyed and discarded cards, and puts it on your side of the board. Now, there is a couple, there are a couple very obvious applications here. 
application number one is uh should beat the crap out of hella right like whatever they're pulling you have it now and they don't have it big deal right but hella is not really a big part of the metagame right now application number two is throw priority and you have a shang chi target and i think this one is actually pretty vastly overstated in today's meta but might not be overstated in a surter meta this is the kind of thing that can really gatekeep and crush a surter deck right like not only are you shang chiing their dudes and they probably are going to be shang chiable because again your curve in the surter deck is three four five ten 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 blow one up get another ten back like that's a really big deal and so i think of this card as a powerful way for when you look at Sarah decks right now, they're very teched for Agent Venom type decks, right? They're teched for that. And once Surter comes out and forces them to adapt to a different situation, I think cards like this are going to be how they're going to have to adapt. It's a 2-3, you're not that mad about it, but if you throw priority, you get activate this on turn 6 after you Shang-Chi. That's just a really powerful thing to do. That's the baseline. Then the question becomes... Are there other ways to make this card good enough to play on its own? Because I think this card is very contextual. Like, if you can pull off the Shang-Chi thing, it's extremely obviously busted. But in the games where you can't, let's say you're playing against the deck that throws priority better than you, or doesn't have access to that kind of power, or is playing Iron Man stuff instead, this card is a 2-3, and it's not doing anything else. So how do we add some consistency to it? I think one way of adding a lot of consistency to it would be using the card Gladiator. Now, Gladiator, if it misses, you're already probably losing and leaving the game. But against those, like, this is the sort of dynamic this card has. Gladiator is excellent against every deck Shang-Chi is bad against. That's the dynamic that's really interesting to me here. Every deck that plays a lot of stuff that Shang-Chi hits, you don't want to be playing Gladiator. But every deck that plays a lot of stuff that Shang-Chi doesn't hit, you do want to be playing Gladiator. And that, like, one-two dynamic I consider genuinely very fascinating. The other thing that you can go at here is try to do discard on your opponent's stuff. Uh, Moon Knight, for example, might be an interesting thing to do here. You could also have Silver Samurai aiming to hit things like Blob and Iron Man. But generally speaking, because it's getting the highest cost stuff, what you're going to be looking at a lot of the time is an attempt to Shang-Chi something or Gladiator for value. Shang-Chi for the big swing, Gladiator for the small swing, right? Turns you a little 3-8, it blows up like their 2-3, suddenly this guy's a 2-6, you played a 2-6 into a 3-8, you're pretty happy with that, right? And that's kind of the role I see Fenris Wolf settling into. The big caveat here is if the Surter decks are that good, like that good, this card into Shang-Chi is going to be like the best play in the game against them. Like being able to A, blow up their guy so their scar costs more before turn six, B, get that guy back for free, biggest deal possible. And there's no real good counterplay to it. Sure, they could play an armor, but that means they're loading up only one lane with all of their big stuff, which is usually the kind of thing you can beat. Maybe they can play a Kyera, except it's a 3, a 4, and a 5 that are actually having this 10-plus power on them, so they're going to be able to get Shang-Chi to anyway. I think this and the Shang-Chi counterplay, before the context of Surtur being what it is and how strong it looks to me, I don't think this would have seen the most play ever. But now, in a world where I think people are playing a lot of 10s, this could be a really big deal. Fenris Wolf could be a very crucial card. In a general context, it won't always be that. But in the specific context of the very strong season pass this month wants you to play a lot of stuff that dies to Shang-Chi, it could be a really big deal. Gore, the God Butcher, a 6 negative 1 with an ongoing ability that gives it plus 2 power for each on reveal card in play. There's a couple things to take in here. The first is, you know, obviously this is like a six very big. But I think the question is going to be how very big is it? How much are we able to rely on our opponents pumping this card? How much do we need to build to pump this card? One card that I think is going to be Gore's best friend is uh, Kate Bishop. 
Not only is she an honor reveal card, she creates two other honor reveal cards most of the time. There is one ongoing one, but still. This is the kind of card that can really stack up and get extra value going on. It's already a good card, and it just makes your gore even stronger. But there is a further question, which is, how are we going to mitigate that negative one stat line? Are we meant to do it by playing Ravona Renslayer? Is that the kind of deck we're supposed to be? Are we like a Ravona sub-theme deck? Are we going to not even bother doing that? Are we just meant to do it by being Agent Venom and we just play a really big guy? Maybe we play some Hope Summers alongside it? I don't know. There's some interesting applications for cards like this, but one of the things that I really want to drill down on is that famously I have often missed on like six infinitely larges being good. And I think a lot of that is due to context, right? I usually miss on that because what was making me miss on that was that there were a bunch of five win a lanes in the game right now. Five win a lane is what makes six infinitely large so strong. Because the goal of the game is to win two lanes. And so if you can have a lane one by turn five, having a six infinity is a really good thing to do. Right now, there are less ways to have a lane one by turn five, but like Storm can actually pull that off. Is there going to be a Storm, invest into Storm, play the biggest gore on earth kind of thing? How big is this guy actually going to get? I am tempted to guess that this guy gets to about six, like, I guess like 617 a lot of the time in an, in like, I don't know what it's going to be on average, but like that feels like when you're happy to play him is about there. I don't know if that's enough. Like this is a card that can get like similar range to blob is sort of what I'm looking at, but I'm not sure exactly how much further than that he can go. Will this kind of card enable like on reveal lockdown strategies? A lot of the cards that go in a storm deck, including storm, are cards that have on reveals on them. So like, can you build a storm on reveal deck that then just plays this guy as the final card? Maybe. I'm interested in him. I also will point out, I kind of enjoy the flavor here because the current flavor of like Asgardians, when you have a uh, Thor, Beta Ray Bill, Jane Foster, the current flavor is on reveals. So I think it's nice that Gore scales with on reveals. I actually, this is like, we're, we're 25 minutes into the video. I could talk about like, comics for like five seconds i read these i read uh i read the thor comics that involved uh gore and then i that they were immediately followed in the omnibus i was reading by like some that involved malekith so like i i, I actually have some background for these characters a little bit i think this is a cool gore i'm into it uh it does it is sort of it does sort of bear pointing out that like yeah after reading the comics i can see why people were so mad at the movie i get it <laughs> but yeah I'm into this gore. I want to see what we can do to hybridize him into other good strategies, though. I want to get him in a Ravona deck. I want to maybe do a Mr. Negative type thing with him. I want to allow myself to play him and some other stuff on the final turn of the game. Ravona is actually a very interesting card with this guy, because like there's a bunch of stuff that Ravona can enable. And right now, all of that is sort of being overshadowed by Agent Venom. And I think a card like this that works so much better with Ravona because you want to play this plus something else, being allowed to do that is so much stronger that I am compelled to at least revisit Ravona uh, when this card comes out in a way that nothing that since Agent Venom's release has happened has compelled me to do that. Finally, there are two additional data mined cards. One of them is Laufey, who I will not be discussing here because as far as I know, based on my conversations and secondhand information that I've seen from data miners, it doesn't seem to like be like actually coming out. It's sort of like the tombstoner Uncle Ben of this season where it's like it's in the info, but it's not really coming out. But this one might actually be coming out. Uh, I believe the guy who runs SnapFan has pointed out that this one might be tied to an event happening during the month. I do not know, obviously, but on the scale of like coming out to definitely not coming out, this card is the one that I have been told is more likely to actually show up. So we have King Atri, who you may remember from the Infinity War and uh, Endgame. I think it's actually just an Infinity War. Uh, yeah, he's just an Infinity War. You may remember him. It's the Peter Dinklage character, the giant dwarf on Nidavellir. He, that's that's this guy. Uh, and the thing that he does is work with Thor a little bit. He's like a backup Jane Foster. He goes in and gets a card that did not start in your deck. He draws that card. It's usually pretty difficult to get the Marvel Snap people to put any kind of draw a card on any card ever. 
And I think that that demonstration, like the demonstration of that has been like very clear cut and very straightforward. They're not very liable to do it, but drawing a card that wasn't in your deck to begin with is a very different thing. And I think King A Tree is like a pretty useful card, honestly, because it is this backup Jane Foster. You now don't need to be a Jane Foster deck. You don't need to draw Jane Foster. It's not always the nut draw. You can just get that card out of your deck, get it into your hand, draw things naturally. I think it might open up a little bit of a different space for the Thor deck, which for the longest time has basically always been alt Sarah, where the goal is just Thor, Beta Ray Bill, Jane, play your dudes, and then your reactive cards that go alongside your hammers, and then you have the stats, and you have your hammers, and you have all of that. It's like a similar concept to a Sarah deck. It's just instead of playing like Hit Monkey Mysterio, you're playing all your hammers, right? And so that kind of deck building might be a little bit impacted by this. The interesting thing is this card specifically being a one cost card does not want to go in a deck with Killmonger, which almost every Thor like reactive alt Sarah deck has been. So I'm kind of interested to see what this guy ends up doing. Obviously cheap activates are a really good thing to have on hand because cheap activates are the kinds that you can actually get onto the board early. The major thing I learned about Activate during the Activate season was that if you can't get it onto the board, if you have a better thing to be doing, it just ends up being very useless later. So the cheaper the Activates are, the easier it is for you to sneak them into your curve and actually have access to them. One thing to note here, though, is that you kind of need this card to be on the board by turn four, right? It's not even a normal Activate. It's an Activate that draws you a card, and you won't be able to play that card until after the turn you activated. So this guy's got to be on the board on four. And I think that's a pretty notable downside. Like, yeah, I think he's good, but that is a notable thing. To me, the most important card coming out this month is easily Surter. I consider it an Agent Venom level threat or a potentially Agent Venom level threat. Like, I obviously have not played with the card. I can't really honestly look at you and say, it's Agent Venom 2! Because I haven't played with it, and for all I know, maybe it won't be. But I think that that's the kind of thing where it's like, Surter v. Agent Venom could be a metagame defining clash here. Like, that could be a really big deal. And because of that, I think that Fenris Wolf might end up mattering a lot, because Fenris Wolf Shang-Chi is such a powerful way to try to deal with Surter decks, which are very interested in playing things that are vulnerable to Shang-Chi. And if anything is going to drag that Surter deck down, it's going to be the ease with which it is disrupted via Shang-Chi and Fenris Wolf. And I think that dynamic is also quite fascinating. I think that they're really taking some swings in this season, and those can be those can be seen with several of these cards. But having Agent Venom and Surter in the same metagame is just a really fascinating thing to me. Because I, I really do think of this card as like similar, like it's 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 Elsa level, not as good but neither is Agent Venom. Like, we haven't ever really had two cards that are this good that push so diametrically opposite in terms of what they want you to do with your deck, but are generally in the same concept of, like, here is my points, here is my interaction, right? Like, I haven't ever seen that, and I'm really fascinated to see what the metagame holds. As always, I've been KM Best. You've been phenomenal. And I will see you in the next one. Please remember to like and subscribe, support the channel. I really appreciate it.